Okay, so yes, we are going to actually talk about films that came out this year and are out on Blu-ray. We are going to talk about films you know the name of. Yes. (laughs) Well, you probably knew some of these names, but here are the ones you definitely know, because you've heard us do the reviews for Spill this year. And, you know, okay, so we're, we're, we're going back and probably covering ground the main site's already covered. But, you know what, we're letting you know these are out already, so you can run and see them. You're like... You probably heard the review in February for some of this stuff and went, oh, I got to see that when it comes out on Blu-ray. And then, you know, you got busy with the whole murdering hookers thing. I know how that gets. <laughs> it's like there's only so many, so much quick lime you can pick up at Home Depot in one stop before the cops start asking questions. This so. is true. This is true. And until they make Dead Hooker Depot, uh, you know, there were a lot of movies that came out in 2012 in theaters, a lot of big uh, releases. So it's impossible to see all of them. I mean, even even as somebody who is kind of sort of a film critic, I missed a lot of the movies in theaters and had to catch them later. I, I saw all of them. That, well, <laughs> that's why I called myself a kind of sort of. Not on the same level yet. We'll, well get there. Only because, yeah, no, nobody's paying you to see every single movie. This I is have true. to see Jack and Jill. You, however, do not. <laughs> that's so true. They mixed blessing at both. <clears> at <throat> best. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so let's start off with Jacket. No, I'm not. I would never <laughs> ever promote that film in any way past what we've already done. But just to promote that it gets buried in the same landfill with copies of E.T. for Atari. <laughs> I'm going to find that fucking landfill. <laughs> Proud owner of that Atari cartridge right here. <laughs> I bet you are. I am. <laughs> I am. Strangely, they're still cheap to buy. <laughs> they, they are, are actually. You, you would think that, that so many got destroyed and thrown out over the years because it's such a bad game that they would be actually super rare, like happens sometimes with that sort of thing. But no. No. no you can. There's a place right down the street from here. You can buy them for like yeah. five bucks. Game Over has all these vintage games, and a lot of them are, because of their rarity, more expensive than, you know... Than you think an old game would be, but still like a dollar fifty for the ET yeah, cartridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, when you guys come to town, if you're into vintage game games, Game Zone is one of the best places I hear in the country now for buying classic game stuff. Game Zone, yeah, or, or is it Game Zone? Game, game over. over, Game Over, Game Over, yeah. yeah. Which is a uh, like they've even got a museum. They do like every single console that there was, including the Power Glove. I know. Oh, I want that Power Glove. I know. You know, I found out to my chagrin that it did was not actually designed to masturbate with. So. Yeah, I know. Well, you learn that the hard way. Yeah. Well, I had that and that like you know it's hard to look at porn that's like all red and vector. So when I had the Virtual Game Boy, it was like mixed with that. Yeah, so. Virtual Boy porn was it, not very good. It was not very good. No, mm-hmm. it was not. Um, but anyway, let's actually go to what we're here. What for. the fuck were we? T- Talking about. We were talking about the movies that actually came out this year, the bigger films. And you know, let's go ahead and start with the one that, it's funny, it kind of got the short shrift, I felt, this year. It, it wasn't mentioned anywhere near as much as I would have thought that it would have been on top ten lists. It's a movie called The Debt, which is oh, the, yeah. directed by John Madden, not the... <laughs> you see, the thing is, when you make a spy movie... I think gotta... we actually made the joke during the original review. It's like, man, I wish there was a part in here when they were explaining the plot that somebody started drawing X's and O's and lines. <laughs> that would have helped. I mean, it was a pretty uh, intricate plot <laughs> it's a pretty complicated plot that was my point um but uh this was it was written by matthew vaughn jane goldman and peter strawn so it's a really strong uh you know it's it's got a, a lot going for it right from the get-go mm-hmm. but it's a remake of a, a very popular 2007 israeli film of the same name which ah that i didn't know actually w- performed very well which makes sense since it's all about mossad agents right uh, which is of course the israeli secret service and this uh in this particular film you've got actors who are playing younger and older versions of the same character mm-hmm. you've got uh helen mirren as uh rachel singer and jessica chastain is the younger 1960s version of henry uh, of uh, rachel singer i really is... wish jessica chastain had worked more this year i mean you just you didn't see her enough she only did like seven movies she's actually doing the dishes right now <laughs> I, I, believe it or not i don't mean that in a controversial way i mean like she's like well, like was bored for three seconds and said hey do you mind if i yeah this is a woman who cannot rest for any given period it's, of time yeah it's all she does is just work um <laughs> you've got uh now i always i never can remember how they, i get explained to me a thousand times how to pronounce Sierran hines name and I've, always, I think it's, I've always said syrian that's how syrian i pronounced hines. it i may be, we may be wrong but, but it's got an accent grave it does <laughs> that has true. to mean something well then it's syrian hines <laughs> he plays uh david peretz and sam worthington plays the young version of that character mm-hmm. and then you've got tom <coughs> wilkinson as stefan gold and the young version of that is martin so don't even get me started. okay one thing i want to say bef- bef- before we get too much into this movie the one thing that bothered me about this movie is the fact that sam worthing oh no go, Sorry, go back i'm gonna get confused otherwise uh sam worthington playing the young version of syrian hines 
he doesn't look like the young version of Syrian Hines. Yeah. He looks like the young version of Tom Wilkinson. None of these characters look like... That was the biggest criticism this film had. And that we had. None of the young characters look like they're older. See, version. I bought Jessica Chastain and Helen Mirren. And I feel like if Plausibly. you had just... If you switched Worthington and Martin Sakas... Yeah, I probably fucked that up. Yeah. If you just switch those two guys as to which younger, or which older Andy Seaton was theirs, it would have been fine. They just need to make Andy Circus play everything. <laughs> <laughs> CG that shit. <laughs> Mo cap it. Seriously, come on. Did you see Rise of the Planet of the Apes? Come on. You should, and we will get there. <laughs> yeah, we will get there. We'll talk about that more. Anyway, the story here is about these guys who are Mossad, Mossad agents, and this is based loosely on the real story of how the mm-hmm. Mossad went into Argentina in the 60s and kidnapped Adolf Eichmann, mm-hmm. like, without the permission of anybody, and yeah. then brought him back to... Who was, of course, Israel. a famous Nazi war cr- yeah, criminal. brought him back to Israel and had a uh, war crime and then hung the guy, you know, mm-hmm. as he well deserved. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm not much for the death penalty, but, you know, when it comes to Nazis, yeah. I go... Fucking load up, Dr. Jones. Yeah, I was like, if we can't kill them with fire from the Ark of the Covenant, you might as well just hang them. <laughs> yeah, you're a Nazi. Sorry, end of story. But they're out for a fictional one, uh, Dieter Vogel, played by Jesper Christensen, known as, a, known as the Surgeon of Birkenkau. And this takes place in, that part takes place in the 60s, as we're seeing them have this elaborate plan to kidnap this guy, which they do, in fact, do. The problem is, as we find out early on, is that, in fact, he got away. And all these years, they've been claiming that they killed him yeah it's basically one of those well he's obviously going to go underground so if we just don't tell anybody we fucked up they'll never know they'll never know now here it is modern day and the problem is and they're all older and the problem is it turns out that he's starting to pop up like there's word that there's an old guy in a nursing home that is claiming to be him and yeah. oops <laughs> we may need to take care of that and the, the funny thing is they're actually getting a lot of accolades and book deals and all this weird stuff now that this you know situation is over and they're older Mossad agents. yeah for what they've done and they're all they're still keeping quiet and then it just becomes one of those situations where they have to decide if they're going to go and deal with it or just you know try and ignore it until basically they die or this guy dies and the film is less about like it's less about this plot and telling a spy film than it is about dealing with the the effect of having to keep a secret for that long yeah. and the guilt that's involved. And I, I think on that level, it really succeeds. I like that aspect of it. I love quite this a movie. Bit. But I felt like the spy story was fractured to the point where it took away from the feeling of, of, of uh, movement and velocity to it. Like it kept going back and forth in time in a way that this sort of film shouldn't. This mm. sort of story shouldn't. Yeah. And I had trouble keeping up my enthusiasm for that part of it. See, but I what I liked about it is actually kind of playing off of that would be the fact that it has that kind of um, old school spy plot, but its sensibilities are very much in that neo spy, like post Jason Bourne type spy movie where it's like things, things move with a certain rhythm. And there's, there's usually like, it's kind of like what we were talking about uh, in point blank where the music feels like it's following them. And every shot is, is kind of a jump from, uh, basically, like showing their movements from one place to another, and it's all very fluid. Uh, it, it, it to me, the way it was shot and the way it was uh, the way it was scored felt like a Jason Bourne movie. But I found the dynamic between these three characters and the way they work together so interesting that I wanted to see a whole series of movies just about the three younger counterparts. Yeah. Just, you know, going on on special missions because it was just so fascinating to watch the three of them work. Well, seeing those three actors together was actually pretty interesting. I thought they had a really good dynamic yeah. together. And, and and once again, though, they, every time it cut away from it, I was like, ah! I, okay. Yeah, I <laughs> get what you As far as that goes. And, but like I said, I didn't dislike the other part. That's when the part of the story that actually had a heart to it started mm-hmm. affecting me, which was about dealing with the guilt of all this over these years and the moral implications, which I guess, I don't know, maybe I'm old, but I find that kind of story much more interesting. Well, yeah, but states. no, that's what keeps it from being just a routine spy thriller, is yeah. that there is this emotional context to it that they keep cutting away to as these as these characters get older. And now, I, I loved this movie. I was, I was really upset that I missed it when it was in theaters, but... Uh, this is probably one of my favorites of the year. Wow. Yeah. What, what about you, Luke? Did you get to see this one? I haven't seen the movie, but I think that it sounds good. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure Brian's got a copy, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so fuck you, Cyrus. I believe Brian. No, it, it is very good. I liked it as well. Just maybe not as much as Brian. Well, definitely not as much as Brian. It's not going to make my top ten list. Sorry, dude. Boop, boop. 
Uh, bonk, bonk. But that's the debt. Moving on. Let's move on to the hangover part two. One of the best. Oh, wait. No, that's not what we're the one of the best. Nah. One of the. No. One of the existing movies of 2011. You know what the thing is about the hangover part two, though? It is the highest grossing R-rated comedy of all time. Are you shitting me? Of all time. It broke like something like eight opening weekend records as well. 35% on Rotten Tomatoes. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Is that because they're actually counting the numbers from the first hangover and they've mistaken this one for the no, first hangover? No, it was huge. Overseas, oh, here. God. And it's baffling because, like I said, I mean, obviously critics don't always see eye-to-eye audiences, but almost everyone I know who was not a critic, just a casual movie watcher, felt the exact same way I did. That it's a film that took the original formula of the, of the hangover. I mean, it Ghostbusters 2 did. It totally took the <laughs> script and it just said, okay, all right, so uh, we're going to take out Bangkok for Vegas. We're going to put a monkey in the place of the tiger, a face tattoo for a missing tooth, a severed finger for a baby. Uh, it still takes place right before a wedding, and we'll have Mike Tyson show up and be do something weird. Yeah. You know, but how are we going to make it better? Oh, we'll make it much grosser. Yeah. Why does anyone want to see it be grosser? They they were writing such a fine line in the first one with they were almost too crass. But they pulled it in just enough to be just thoroughly enjoyable. Yeah. And this one, they were like, no, fuck it. We're going completely over the edge. And I I did not enjoy a single moment of this movie. I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Here we so, go. Says the guy, guys. Says the guy who love- sounds like he just woke up in Bangkok after I'm a night of party. Saying. I love this. I love it when this happens. <laughs> Luke, please explain. Oh, I wouldn't say I loved it or anything. But, it, but I, I, I mean, <laughs> at the expense of taking your criticism and turning it into a positive... I liked the first movie, and this was the first movie again. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like, what's, it worked. What, the things that worked for me the first time around were still funny the second time around. Like, yes, I like I laughed at a tiger the first time, and I laughed at a monkey the second time, and I laughed at you know Kim Jong the first time, and I laughed at Kim Jong's penis the second time. Like, I don't. I, I mean, thought. <laughs> see, I thought this was the movie where Kim Jong for me jumped the shark. Absolutely. Oh, he like, completely did. Oh, but I thought that was funny. I was <laughs> like, okay, enough Kim Jong Hollywood, please, please stop. <laughs> Fuck. But you know what? It's funny because I kind of agree with you because I was not the world's biggest fan of the first one. I liked it, but then the whole rest of the world went, yeah, and freaked out. And I was like, okay, you're making me like it less by how much you're, <laughs> you're freaking out over this movie. You like it too much. It's not that good. It's it's good, but not great. And I thought this one, if, if I had seen this before the first one, I would have felt exactly the same way I did in the first one. <laughs> Look, well, here's the deal. These are both big budget comedies. Like, nobody's winning an Oscar for either of these fucking films. They have one goal. And that's to make you laugh. And yeah. if, if they succeed in that, great. And I think The Hangover, the first part, obviously succeeded far more than, than this part did with uh, with both critics and audiences. But, you know, for me, I didn't laugh as much, but I still laughed. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of I think okay you just it. like it because Zach Galifianakis kind of resembles you in this oh, movie. Oh, shenanigans. No, his, his, the, I'm pretty sure Luke's dick has to be bigger. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> sure. I meant more the, the, the hair and the beard situation. Uh, you know, it's, it's stuff like that though, where it's like, it feels like it needs to denigrate its, its characters to that level that I really started getting distasteful for me as it went along. I mean, the first film. At least it felt like it liked its main characters, even yeah. though they were kind of douchey. They still were like, oh, you know how guys are. They go to Vegas. It was like, uh. And here, it really, as it goes along, you start to really dislike these guys as people altogether. And then the movie shows how much it hates them by just piling the shit on over and over again. To the point where, by the end, it's like, okay, I believed they were able to reconcile everything and, and kind of smooth everything over with the bride, but... By the end of the second one, I'm like, no fucking way. You've got to be kidding me. Yeah. And uh, what is it? Uh, uh, what's the name of the, the freaking guy, uh, the nerdy guy? Uh, Ed Helms, Doc Stu, is married to uh, like this total ridiculous Asian hottie who mm-hmm. apparently was the, the most successful person ever to come out of the real world. Oh, good, <laughs> <Yeah>. good. <laughs> you know, it was like somebody... There's did. a feather in your yeah. cap. Uh, Jamie uh, Jamie Chung. She's so hot. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I mean, like, I, like it's not just the way that Stu looks, or Ed Helms as it was, mm-hmm. but he's not Ed Helms. He's not big Hollywood celebrity Ed Helms who could hook up with a girl like that. He is a dentist yeah. who is a total nerd and not a terribly likable guy when it comes down to it. I mean, yeah. sure, he means well, but he has zero charisma. I just, I, It's funny, like, my suspension of disbelief for that... 
I could watch crazy fantasy sci-fi stuff and go, yeah, no problem. But that, yeah, I was, I drew the line. And it only gets <laughs> less believable from there. Yeah, it does really. I wish this could have been better. I didn't think it was horrible. Like I said, until Mike Tyson sings, which, oh, oh, oh geez. hooray. <laughs> what do you mean? Hooray. I'm still traumatized. Karaoke fail. <laughs> Seriously. The worst ever. I was one of those. What were they thinking? And I love that song, <laughs> sir. You have butchered a classic murray head is turning over and i don't know if he's dead but he's still turning over in his grave yeah he went to his grave specifically to turn over in it. <laughs> uh yeah i don't know if i'd like one night in bangkok as much as you do but still uh i, I don't know I, the I creme de la creme of the chess world in a show with everything but yule brenner it's true it's, if it had yule brenner it would have been even better but, <laughs> uh anyway let's move on because i don't you know that was the hangover, that was too. hangover part two. <laughs> now let's talk about another film that we're going to disagree about. Which oh, is goody. Cowboys and Aliens. Aha! Now, you've probably heard a lot about how this isn't a very good film. You probably have. The internet was rife with people being very hyperbolic about how much they hated Cowboys and Aliens. And I would like to say, once again, reiterating what I did on the original review, that uh, while they are being very exaggerated, they're right. It's not a very good movie. <laughs> But it's not a totally terrible movie either. I think there's actually a lot going on here in this movie. I mean, it's John Favreau, so it's not like he's gonna. It's gonna be a fucking steaming pile of shit. All right, I know Iron Man too, but shut up. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's got Daniel Craig, Harrison Ford, Olivia Wilde. I mean, it's it's cowboys versus aliens. I you know. I mean, obviously it's got some benefit to it, but there's so much that just doesn't feel right it's like it's almost hard to put your finger on all the ways in which this film went wrong more than just to say i never really felt like i was with it huh i mean i guess part of the problem is is that like it was based on a graphic novel that was written as nothing but a pitch for this movie like it wasn't like oh this great graphic novel cowboys and aliens no it was a really terrible graphic novel that was written entirely so this guy could get a movie deal who wrote it and i it's. I didn't think the movie was much better than the graphic novel. Really, had some decent effects. I don't know. I know you guys disagree with. Well, me, yeah. So. I mean, I I had heard, and this is another one I missed in theaters. And you know, I hate talking about hype when it comes to you know your opinion of movies because it's such a, it's such a completely intangible thing, and and ultimately doesn't mean much. But I went into this knowing how much everybody disliked it. So I was expecting it to. I don't know if that lowered my expectation or probably, what. Probably, frankly, but, probably. It but I went yeah. into it and I like from the get go. I was like, all right, I'm having fun with this. This is really. I like the way it's <laughs> shot. I I like that Daniel Craig is this crazy, silent, violent animal. Daniel Craig instead, like Daniel Craig. Okay, if you're unaware, Daniel Craig wakes up with this thing on his arm that you've seen in the trailer. And has amnesia, more or less. He has no idea what the fuck happened to him. And instead of asking questions, he punches people. His reaction to every of stimulus. More questions, he punches more people. Yes, his... I, I like that. I like that. anything that happens, he punches people. Yeah, that's I... one of the more absurd elements of the movie. Is his reaction to every single stimulus is to hurt something. And the strongest thing about this film is actually Daniel Craig playing this very exaggerated cowboy, like you know a. a... Clint Eastwood esque type of character as he has amnesia, doesn't remember anything about he was, but it seems pretty clear he was a bad guy. Yeah. You know, in fact the the studio actively marketed this as a sci fi unforgiven. Swear to God. You're kidding. No, I was reading about it. I was like, what? I don't remember seeing that. But yeah, in a lot of markets, that's how they were selling it. That's hilarious. Yeah. That is not what this film is. No. And actually, I I just think it's a really fun concept. And I will say it runs out of steam a little bit in the third act. But (laughs) I loved it up to that point. I was having so much fun with it. And like, I like the idea. I always loved the idea of mixing sci-fi with a Western. I love that. Um, And I was just, I thought the action sequences were great. I thought... Uh, most everybody in the cast was doing a good job, although I thought Harrison Ford was phoning it in a little bit. Really? Because I thought, I thought Harrison Ford was finally acting. And I was like, he, There were moments where he I was. I was like, where the fuck were you during Crystal Skull shooting and shit? <laughs> Harrison Ford actually enjoying himself on a movie set. I, I get I that know. feeling with Harrison, I, and I get that too, although I thought that his, he he was written badly for, I got the feeling he was really enjoying himself. And I think yeah. that's because he was in a Western. He's an old school Hollywood actor. He probably was dying to get a chance to be in a Western. Yeah. I mean, is there another Harrison Ford Western? <laughs> 
I mean, not I'm aware of. Not fuck. that I'm aware of. I'm, maybe there is one. I, I just uh, we're we're gonna get called on it in the comment section, but I I I can't think of but one who wouldn't, my head. Like who wouldn't? Especially a guy. You know, he's in his sixties. He's a huge fan of, of of film. He's a very much an outdoors man. You yeah. Know? I mean, totally. have you heard that story about how he rescued those hikers from a fire. Yeah. He's a helicopter? real goddamn hero. How awesome is that? Can you imagine you're in a fire? What are we gonna do? We're gonna die. Oh no! Look at the helicopter. Harrison Ford. Oh God! That hurts get me. in. <laughs> <laughs> Get on my plane. <laughs> Come with me if you want to live. <laughs> I know it's not Harrison Ford. But he could say it even better than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Totally could. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say that you know this was this was a type of film we, that Brian and I were watching you know while doing some other things, so it probably only got Smoking 75 75 percent of our attention. <laughs> no, I would I wouldn't but, even say I would say it would be more like there was only a couple of plot points that I missed, and I actually went back and rewound, and and they worked even when I saw them the second time. Uh, but one of the things that I thought was great about this movie was um, Sam Rockwell, who was like unstoppably funny well, I, out of nowhere. Like I did not expect his character to be the comic relief. It's got so many great actors in this film who are underused. They're like Clan- Clancy Brown is in this film. Why wasn't there more Clancy Brown in this film? He's Clancy Brown, and there was too much Paul Dano. I'm like, I'm sorry, that kid freaks me out. There's he freaks you out, but I like I liked him. He's a good actor, but don't Did I miss that because yeah. I thought he got uh, absconded with yeah. early on. That's and... too much, Paul Dano. Already. Okay, yeah. and let's talk about I was that. Like he's not in the fucking movie very long. I, I thought Olivia Wilde's really good in it, but there's a weird plot twist with her that I felt felt totally inorganic and just plain <laughs> silly as fuck. It was, I it, was love it. it was silly. I love it, but that was one of my like junk food cinema type moments where I'm like right. this is retarded but it's kind of funny the number one thing I liked about this movie was Walton Goggins who's abandoned yeah. an old friend of Daniel Craig's character but once again their story was like what that was the one thing that I was like every time he was on screen and got to that story I was like oh I want to know more about that and again Walton Goggins gives Daniel Craig the opportunity to showcase his only reaction to any stimulus and he like literally Walton Goggins is talking and out of nowhere Craig punches him in the mouth and goes be quiet, I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> he punches, and in fact, Daniel Craig hates crotches in this movie. He does. He he's, kicks he's people, knees people, cop. and in fact, he even punches a spaceship in he the crotch. He punched a spaceship in the dick. It was Where amazing. Where is a spaceship's dick? I, it, he found I it. I swear to God, like, there are two little lights that look like the balls, and fucking Daniel Craig just goes right He must have been one of those Transformers from part two. He's yeah, holding exactly. on to the back of this, exactly. like, ship thing, which looks like he's holding on to its haunches, and then he reaches the fucking thing on his arm in underneath and fires. And I swear to God, it looks like he punches a spaceship in the dick. Wow. It's an insane movie. We had a lot of fun with this. So, of course I had fun with this. It's funny that everything that you're saying about it that you like are exactly the same things that I think are in a lot of people's criticisms and what they didn't like. But, you know what? They were looking at it differently. I, I looked you at went, it. You looked at it for camp value. It's called Cowboys and Aliens. <laughs> no, no, yeah, I get that. I'm sorry. If you went into this expecting a fucking can winner, then <laughs> yeah, that's your own fucking problem. No, no, no. I agree with that. But I think even so is just a popcorn film. I just didn't really think it sold. It didn't really work for I me. ate my popcorn, Luke's popcorn, and then I had to go make more popcorn. <laughs> yeah, oh, so you were smoking pot is what you were I was. About. I had the munchies hardcore. <laughs> All right. So that's Cowboys and Aliens. Your mileage may vary. Indeed, indeed it may. <laughs> Let's move on to one that your mileage probably won't vary on, which is Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Woohoo! I gotta tell you right now, uh, if we had a separate award for the biggest surprise of the year, Definitely. it would be Rise of the Planet of the Apes, because this was on my list of films that uh, I wouldn't feel too bad calling in sick for the night. <laughs> yeah. Was, you know, I was like, really? I don't... Did you see The Last Planet of the Apes? I oh, mean, it was it, so bad. It made me fucking mad. And it was from a second-time director who had made an okay movie that I liked called The Escapist. The Escapist, yeah, it was Rupert pretty good. Wyatt. Yeah, it was good, but it wasn't, like, notable. Not really. No. Yeah. I was no. like, all right, this is going to be another one of these. You got James Franco in the as a lead human, I'm like... Franco's starting to get on my nerves. And it's Franco Uh, as like... He's starting to get on everyone's nerves. That's why he's going back to school. It's like Franco is one of the foremost biologists, which I know Franco himself is a very smart guy. Sure. But cinematically, you're like, really, James Franco? Shouldn't he be one of the foremost... Cinematically, he looks like a fucking retard. He should be one of the foremost herbologists. Exactly. But uh, not probably not the other thing. But just It's something about his lips, man. I don't know what it is. They just like, they come out to like here, and he's like, "Uh, yeah, uh, I am James Franco. He'll be in stuff I really like him in, but then he'll turn around and do stuff like 
your highness where I just want to punch him in the face and <laughs> Thank it overrules you. everything else that he does. <coughs> you know, it's or like, the Oscars. Yeah, no doubt. Right? So <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. Yeah, or the Oscars. But you know what? This film, I, I, and I love the original series. Even the, oh, hell yeah. Even the weaker ones I still can watch over and over and over again. And this may be the best Planet of the Apes film. And I mean, I know that's weird to say because the original is a classic. I love it with all my heart. So much nostalgia in there, but... Like, just as a film... This is a damn good film. This probably is the best Planet of the Apes It doesn't film. have the gaping pacing problems that the original does. I love the original, too. I'm a huge fan of the series. But there are moments in that first film was just like, oh my god, do I have to wait around for the Earth to explode to make this movie good? <laughs> oh I god. don't think I would agree with that kind of, the, the conceit, but... but uh, <laughs> I, I think that this film is it's all right so the original was very much a b movie told at a level yes this is a movie that doesn't acknowledge at all that it's a b film it's mm-hmm. like, no i refuse to accept that that's a thing i need you guys to go with us the audience to come with us and just accept the suspension of disbelief that mm-hmm. that that they've injected these you know this this institute that franco works at is uh injecting these chimpanzees with a biotechnology thing that work ends up working and significantly boosting their intelligence uh-huh. and which nowadays doesn't really seem terribly implausible no, I, don't know. No, no, no. I read discover magazine and i'm like yeah they kind of working on shit like that already yeah they're working so, toward actively moving us toward the planet of the goddamn apes thanks yeah. science <laughs> good job good job uh and you know if i was going to say one irritating thing about that is just that i i get sometimes overall mad at science fiction that feels like it needs to be nothing but Man, technology's gonna fuck us all. I'm like, oh, come on, will you please stop that? <laughs> if anything's gonna save us, it's technology at this point. <laughs> but anyway, and Cox is still gonna be saying that uh, when you know the human there at Skynet becomes active. You're damn right. I'll be I'll be there working Skynet with the double joystick. <laughs> so I should just shoot the, you now. The virtual boy helmet. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it! Cox is waving as the singularity goes by. <laughs> <laughs> you mean my driver? Yes. yes, yeah. Nope. <laughs> All right, fair enough. All right, so anyway, so they end up getting an ape that, like, they're ordered to kill, and James Franco is just a big softy, so he abducts the ape secretly away and brings him home. And part of the reason he does that as well is because his own father, played by John Lithgow, is suffering from Alzheimer's. And this drug, the point of it initially was to try and cure people with Alzheimer's. So he's yeah. like, okay, well, if I have these samples and, and this ape, I can... It gives him a motivation to like ne- tirelessly work on this project, no matter what the cost. Well, now, and I don't want to give away too much about this film for those who haven't seen it, but I will say that as it goes along, the good first half of the film is is almost a feel good movie. It yeah. really is, yeah. where, where you really get into it, the relationship between this guy, uh, between between this little family that's formed here, as well as a uh, uh, Frida Pinto, who is one of the hottest women in the world. Yeah, right she's now, gorgeous. By the way, who it becomes James Franco's girlfriend, and she's a primatologist. As they sort of, you know, he kind of becomes their their son in a way. Yeah. Their ape Caesar, which of course is played by Andy Serkis, who has gotten nominated in a bunch of different circles and a bunch of different awards for Best Supporting Actor. I I totally had him at the top. I, was like, I, I sincerely hope he gets a nod. At I think something. It's, yeah. a, it's high time that, it, if nothing else, the Academy recognizes that mocap performances, especially Andy Serkis' mocap performances, yeah. are not just a special effect. There is a huge amount of performance that goes into that. It's not just somebody on a computer making it happen. Well, Everything you're seeing in Caesar, just like everything you saw in Gollum, is Andy Serkis doing that. One of the best things about this Blu-ray is to be make you hyper aware of that because the deleted scenes feature stuff with him where they obviously hadn't animated it after the fact because they knew they weren't going to use it. So it's just Serkis acting, you know, <laughs> walking around in his mocap suit doing the whole thing and you go wow this guy is amazing i think that we're seeing as big a change in like the way that one would teach acting to performers as you did when we switched to the talkies in a lot yeah. of ways i mean it's a completely different fashion of acting that mm-hmm. has a, a very specific set of skills that's almost weird it's almost going back again like it's like all right so acting like before method acting which was designed specifically for film yeah uh like it was there was you watch older films and sometimes everyone seems like they're exaggerating too much right mm-hmm. because they're all trained for stage acting and a which is exaggerated much larger exactly yeah. uh now it's like we got to go back and do that again. <laughs> yeah, you know they got to go back to stage acting. It's it's almost gone back to uh, mocap is almost Greek mask acting again. Yeah, where you do everything uh, larger than life because you know you have you have barriers that you have to get through. Yeah, and it's yeah it's incredible. The to only watch. reason I feel like a lot of awards ceremonies don't have a specific mocap 
acting award yet is because who the fuck is going to win but Andy Serkis at this <laughs> yeah. point? Because they'd have to call it the Andy Serkis Award. But so many more big filmmakers are like, I see now what the advantage of doing mocap for everything is that we're going to see more and more big name actors going, I really want to try that. Mm. I, I'm super interested in seeing what I can do as as a performer in using that. I think that's great. And 20 years from now, people are going to look back at Andy Serkis as one of the great actors of our One era. of the pioneers you know, of one that. One of the pioneers of the style of yeah. that type of performance. I mean, that guy's got a career for life, even if it's just as a teacher yeah you know i mean and this is the the film that they're going to look back on i mean more even more so than lord of the rings as the movie that that defined what this was capable of yeah i mean it went from having just the the dots the little ping pong balls over your body to literally like l- tiny little x's on every single place of the actor's face yeah where the lasers can pick up on so every facial expression is being translated into this i mean caesar in this film is one of the most astonishing performances this year really is. It's touching and heartbreaking. And yeah. Wow. Yeah, I can't say enough good things about this. And absolutely, if you're a fan of the original franchise, this uh, cops heavily from not only the original Planet of the Apes, but Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, which is the yeah. fourth one, and by far my favorite of the old franchise. Uh, and I think they do such an incredible job of incorporating elements from both of those two movies to create a new mythology for the franchise so which is why i have a problem calling this a sequel a prequel or a remake because it it is using so many elements of these different films to kind of tell the story again and it, it's so it's a, complicated it's a, it's a total reboot is yeah what it is it's like and they've said that as well they're like yeah we are doing a sequel well no duh it was a huge performer yeah. critically and at the box office yeah and you know i you know, they don't even know what they're going with it at this point. I just hope they don't feel like they have to tread the exact same ground that previous films have done. It's like, yeah. sure, take influences from them, take bits here and there. But you know what? Make Go your own way, because this certainly did. We maybe don't need a cult of nuclear mutants that worship a bomb. Maybe we just leave that part out. <laughs> Wait, but I was planning on leading that cult. I even have the patches all designed and everything. you got to have patches, right? Oh, glorious bomb. Wonderful bomb. I have a bunch of little tiny metal pins you can put on your leather jacket. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> so that was Rise of the Planet. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. We're getting, too, we're getting too geeky for Luke. I mean, Luke, you always know the right moment oh, to time. Oh, I love up. you all. <laughs> so let's move on to Kung Fu Panda 2, oh, which was oh, oh. one of the best sequels this year, I thought, and there were Totally. Of sequels this year um and know, weirdly one of the best action movies this year well that's the thing about this film uh, you know it's the the director of kung fu panda 2 jennifer u nelson which is actually the first uh that makes this marks the first animated hollywood feature film directed by a woman oh fantastic uh, but she was a stunt performer for part one Really? Yeah, as well as doing a lot of other duties on there. She animated the whole credit sequence, the whole beginning sequence in there. Oh, nice. Yeah. That was but, beautiful. But she really knocked it out of the park with this. This is, it's, I, I'm not even, I'm not going to say the story is better. The story's about the same. You know, okay, it is what it is. It's a vehicle for getting you the set pieces that absolutely. are absolutely amazing. It's a coat rack. It's a very basic coat rack, and then they just hang action on top of yeah, it. Yeah, it's not offensive or anything. No, or really no, 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 no. It's just, I mean, the best thing about it is it's 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 got Gary Oldman <laughs> in the vol- role of the evil peacock villain, and he's so good in he's it. He's totally Dude, peacocking. Oh, uh, yeah. It's who would have thought you could make a sell peacock as a villain, but wow, he nails it. Um, <laughs> and, and it's got kind of a little bit more of a maybe a soft touch emotionally to it, mm-hmm. but the action sequences are so much more, like, they just fast and and well choreographed i mean it's like watching classic shaw brothers which stuff. when you watch those they don't have the most complicated stories no they're very basic because what you what you're watching it for are the the action shots and this has some of the coolest animated action sequences i think i've ever seen it's funny because it's taking that sensibility from all those early films where we, we, a lot of the time it was at people doing animal style stuff like i for, for the record if you can i think they re-released it they did re-release it recently under dragon dynasty there's a movie called mad monkey kung fu which is all about a guy training you love that in movie classic style to be monkey style and it's one of many films that are like that that focus around animal style styles but that's a particular highlight of seeing how crazy it is watching an actor really emulating a animal style of movement and mixing it with martial arts stuff yeah and this does that but in an animated sense and in the sense that they are actually those animals so if those animals could do all this what would their martial arts be like right that's it's amazing amount of creativity goes in and it's got such a great meta aspect to it where it's like this the style of kung fu manifested as that animal who is then doing that style of kung fu. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's I love a, that. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Hey, you know who did punch up on the script? Who wrote a lot of the jokes? I do not. Charlie Kaufman. What? Nice. I swear to God. As Very we're sitting cool. here talking about the, how basic the story is. Yeah. Charlie Kaufman. Yeah, what? Did a lot of the punch up on the jokes and the funny sequences in it. Huh. So, yeah. Which makes sense because it was funnier than the original. If not a little bit more absurd, which once again, Charlie sure. Kaufman. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> So, did you see this one, Luke? I did. I thought it was beautiful. Really, really well animated film. I, I, we actually saw it in 3D, and I thought the 3D was some of the best I had seen as well. Yeah, yeah. it was a great 3D. Yeah, if you choose to buy this in 3D, uh, it's it's definitely... If you have one of those fancy, dancy, rich people who can afford a 3D television <laughs> or actually want one, I'm, I'm not really... I think it's fun in the theater. I'm not sure I need one at home. But... <laughs> Unless we're watching Shark Night. Yeah, you know what? Um, in case Sony is listening or anybody who manufactures a 3D TV, <laughs> I'm bound to talk a lot better about 3D home releases if someone was to, you know, give me one. What? We're not whores? <laughs> Fuck you! <laughs> I'm not asking for anything from the fans. I'm asking for it from the studios. Oh, well, that's that's fine. Just saying. I'm saying. I don't. You can't even listen. Let listen, know. listen. I'm just saying. That's all I'm saying. All right, so I'm. <laughs> Sorry. Jesus Christ. Anyway, that's Kung Fu Panda. We've, we've talked about that at length already on the site. It's hard not to say how good that is. But you know what? Let's uh, let's skip ahead to uh, Warrior, which is another one oh, of the best films this year. I totally but agree. That nobody saw! Yeah, it, it was unfortunate. I think I think a lot of the problem with that is that it was not marketed well. It was. I think people saw the trailers and all they saw was it's a mixed martial arts movie. Yeah, they expected it was like all the other mixed martial arts movies, which are like like no. Never Back Down and well, there's what's that Channing? Some... Is that the Channing Tatum one? Never Back no, Down. But you're thinking of fighting. Fighting. Well, there fighting. Are some, there yeah. are some smaller That's the name ones. Of the Channing Tatum. Oh, Jesus Christ. There are some smaller ones that are kind of fun, like Undisputed Three. Wow. Oh yes, Undisputed Three. Incredibly fun movie, but not a blockbuster. Not the sort of thing that you go, okay, you watch it with your mom and dad and yada yada. Right. This is the Rocky of today. This is the and, Rocky of, of MMA. And I don't mean that in the, oh, all the Rocky cliches. I mean, like, it is a fighting film that is, like, up there in the Rocky level in quality. It's that focused on character. The emotional resonance of the story is that strong. And not only is it an underdog story, it's a double underdog story. Wow. And is this, I don't know if it is or not, but I can't help but think that it's the first film with this sort of setup, of which there, of course, are many. You know, the guy battle, underdog battling his way to the final fight, in which there are two underdogs and you don't know which one to root for. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, inevitably, these two actors, Tom Hardy and uh, uh, Joel Edgerton, who are brothers, very estranged brothers, mm -hmm. who are both fighting for their own reasons and are yeah. both over the hill for this sort of thing. Yeah, both, both of them, no one things ha have a chance yeah and they both are fighting towards that assuming they probably won't have to fight each other one of them will get knocked out before the end but of course you know i'm not spoiling anything to tell you that yes of course they end up fighting each other the trailer for the movie the they sold the whole movie based on the the two guys fighting in the main event <laughs> are brothers yeah and it's it's fantastic. You like every step of this film, every inch of the way along. You'll be wishing that they don't have to fight each other because you like them both. Yeah. You want them both to succeed, but only one can ultimately. Your allegiance is up for grabs. It totally sells it. And there was points in this film that the only reason I didn't stand up and start cheering in the audience is because I didn't want to embarrass Brian who was sitting next. Well, to we me. didn't want to get thrown. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We didn't want to get thrown out of the Alamo. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. But it was very tempting. It really was. And in fact, one of the one of the best parts about seeing this knowing that Dark Knight Rises is coming out this month is when you see Joel or not Joel excuse me when you see Tom Hardy fight people in this movie when he's let off the leash he is brutal he puts to rest any doubts anyone could possibly have about him playing Bane because he oh it, he doesn't just hurt these people he pulverizes which these people which I can't imagine that anyone who had seen Bronson would have had any reservations to begin with right so but I, not uh, not too many people saw Bronson unfortunately that is a damn shame you should all go rent Bronson from the yeah, director tonight. of Drive Yes. Yeah. No. Yeah. From the director of Drive. So, what else do you need? And he's got Tom Hardy and the guy, everybody freaking out about Drive this year. There you go. Why aren't you Absolutely. watching Bronson already? It's really good. But you should be watching Warrior. You should it's definitely a, be watching it's Warrior. A film you it watch sounds with your, like a double feature to me. Yeah. yeah it's, there you go. It's a film you watch with your family. You can watch it with your friends. It's it's got Nick Nolte and who was my vote for best supporting actor. Oh this yeah. Year, I, I he was high up on my dad, list as well as an ex alcoholic who was like the worst dad ever. Like mm -hmm. I mean, you never really see all the details, but it's clear like this. This guy couldn't have been much worse than he was. But he's so desperate to reconnect with them now that he's cleaned up and they want nothing to do with him. And it's just heartbreaking to watch him try and try and try to reconnect with them. And at, at one point, this isn't a spoiler, but at one point, like, he's trying to get invited into his own son's house. 
and he's standing outside just kind of looking like, oh, is that, is that my granddaughter? What's it? And it just closes the door and it's just like, oh, it's brutal. It just hurts so much. Oh man, there's so many great moments in this film. I just, it was another one of the big surprises of this movie. Not a movie I really expected. I expected to maybe have fun with it, but mm-hmm. not to be like moved almost to tears at points by it. I yeah. Mean, it's emotionally rich, really powerful visceral film i mean the fight sequences will just knock you on your ass watching as they knock each other on their asses yeah. <laughs> it's not one of those things where it's two guys hugging on the floor for oh no 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 <laughs> no they cut all the boring parts of mma out yes they do I, uh, and i, I think it looks good now we're gonna have get you not it. seen this i haven't seen one. Oh my god it's so good i wish you told me i have it sitting at home i would have revisited it because fuck yeah warrior yeah it's absolutely terrific and it's funny because like like a lot of things critics said it's like does it hit some of the a, a lot of the genre tropes that we're uncomfortably familiar with at this time at the, these type of films yeah but it does it in a way that it makes you feel like you're seeing them happen for the first time. But it hits time. them so hard it knocks their teeth to the back of their skull. It, it really does. Uh, this is absolutely fantastic. It's definitely on my top ten list for the year. But let's move on to another That film. was Warrior. That's That was Warrior. Thank you. Uh, and uh, this is one that is not on my top ten list, but it was an underappreciated comedy that I'm yeah. surprised. <laughs> Hell, they didn't even put this out on Blu-ray. They only put it out on DVD. Whoa. It's a good old-fashioned orgy. That's bullshit. And I, I can't help but think it's because, I guess, people with this studio was uncomfortable in the first place putting out a film with this title like i don't imagine they I mean, shouldn't what, have done it like, like i can mean, imagine what the arguments were like about it before it came out like saying no no that's what we're calling it no you can't call a film a good old-fashioned orgy and put a it's it. got a pretty uh out there concept and the, the concept basically is that these friends who have uh, this guy who's who's kind of a loser been coasting on his dad's money <laughs> Uh, has this really great beach house. And they go there all the time, and they throw these ridiculous parties. They're incredibly immature, but the dad decides he's going to sell the house, so they only have one bash remaining. So they're trying to think of the, the biggest thing they can possibly do to celebrate this last party at the house. So, of course... They decide to have an orgy. Yeah. This is a a group of, like, male and female friends. And a very self-aware sort of, like, oh, it's the cheesiest thing you could possibly do, which is exactly why we got it. It was like the hipster approach to having an orgy, which is like, that that would be so ridiculous. Let's totally do it. Yeah, exactly. And, you know... It is awkward. There's no question that's uncomfortable. And people saying, why is it that like all the women are super hot and only one of the guys is even mildly an attractive man, uh, I guess by somebody's standard. Okay, yeah, you've got that sort of thing going on. I don't know what to tell you. It's a double standard, whatever. But if you can leave all that baggage aside and just watch this as a straight comedy, it's actually pretty goddamn entertaining. Absolutely. And there's a, there's a certain degree of sweetness that they come around to with these characters and their relationship to each other as we get towards the end that makes you go, you know what? This is the type of film that usually would make you start thinking all these people are so ugly that you just don't care what happens to them, like so ugly inside. But that's not the case here. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was great. And one of the things that I really liked about it is the fact that it 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 acknowledges the fact that it's awkward. Because they spend weeks going back and forth. Are we going to do this? is weird. We shouldn't do this. This I don't want to... Oh, no. And I, this is... Uh, and then they finally decide to do it, and even as they decide to do it, it's still like, how do we get started? We don't. We're not swingers. We're normal people. Like, what? What does a normal person do in this situation? I actually really like the way the film handled that because you know, you're sitting down to a movie called A Good Old Fashioned Orgy. You know what you're getting into. Yeah. You're expecting an orgy, and so even with the build up, like. You know that eventually you're going to get to an orgy or this is a really shitty title. And so <laughs> so by the time you do, like, you've kind of got, you, you've you made your own, you know, you have your own expectations of what that's going to look like. And I don't know, at least for me, I'm like, how are they really going to do this? Because my expectation is like porn star orgy and, <laughs> yeah. and A, you know, they're not going to do that in a mainstream movie and B, like character wise, because Part of the build-up is they do spend so much time, you know, making you care about these characters, and so by the time the the orgy rolls around, I don't know. It's just it's. I think it's really sweetly done. Is that yeah. a way to no, describe an orgy? You're like, right. It's weird that it comes to that point that you're like, I actually, I, I think this is nice. It's yeah, like, and it, it's it's funny because like there's this whole thing. I I think it's with Nick Kroll's character who like 
is kind of a weird if, if you don't know who Nick Kroll is he's kind of a weird looking dude in fact in one episode of The League which is a hilarious oh, show you so should watch funny. The League he, he he makes a reference to the fact that he looks like a uh, Nazi propaganda poster of a Jew <laughs> which is totally <laughs> true so that's funny. exactly what he fucking looks like <laughs> um, but I'm pretty sure that, that he's the character I'm thinking of I, I saw this movie when the it played theaters uh, no it was just the, that he he's kind of like uh man what's the word like very good in the sack i guess oh, sure. is the best way to put it like wow. unexpectedly and the girls are like oh like no like a- his name's adam and he's so like, neurotic and they think he's the yeah, last guy who's like gonna be oh but fuck. he's like he's really great and spends his, all the time in the right places and all that good stuff and i, and I really like that because i'm like man i wish people were more open and would like realize that about a lot of geeky guys who also <laughs> wow, this made... sounds like a platform well, all I of a sudden. Say, I see where this is going. I <laughs> and I don't support... know what you're talking about. I support this. So, Aisha Tyler, if you're listening to this. <laughs> hey! Aisha Tyler I'm is just saying. spoken for. That's true. By me. By but uh, Tyler, Tyler Labine in this, who is also fantastic. Absolutely fantastic in Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. No, I don't think we can emphasize that enough. Oh my god. He plays... Uh, he plays the character who is the <laughs> least um, attractive, I'm just going to say, for lack of a better word. He looks well, like me. He's the, <laughs> or really any one of us, really. <laughs> yeah, he, just, he happens to have a beard. So. Chubby and bearded. He's an amalgamation of all of us. But yeah, he's, he's hilarious. His one-liners are great. I think all of these characters, all of these actors who have really not worked together. I, you don't see too many of these people working together. Yeah. Uh, just do a great job making us believe that they've been friends for years. And Jason Sudeikis, who sometimes irritates the shit out of me, like the only movie I've, I've seen him in that I really liked him in was Horrible Bosses. Uh, and he's been in a lot of other stuff that I really couldn't stand. But I liked him a lot in here. He was very charming. Yeah, he managed to be the guy who they've got as the Bill Murray of the cast. Yes. You know, whatever it's, you know, everyone knows the type of thing I'm talking about. The lead guy who's the most handsome out of everyone, who is the most charismatic out of everyone, who gets what he wants nine times out of ten he is the leader of the group and and is uh, you know has a way of talking that yeah. reminds you of that classic type persona he sells it here he's totally. not too obnoxious and he where he is as he has been and other things uh and same thing leslie bibb who i normally have issues with i think she plays it way too broad she's actually pretty goddamn good in here yeah so, absolutely yeah. it's a very very underrated comedy and Mostly because I don't. Yeah, you're right. Nobody fucking saw this movie. Yeah, yeah nobody saw it because the t- a lot of th- theaters didn't pick it up. Yeah, because the title. Yeah, they probably thought it was. I mean, it it sounds like an exploitation title to be honest, but it's I it's actually wa- a pretty sweet movie. I kind of want to see that movie. I, like Roger Corman's a good old fashioned orgy. I, 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 not kinda. I really <laughs> want to see that movie. That sounds really good. All right, last one as we do the new releases, and you know what? I've said it so many times already, and I'm sorry, Corey. I know we've got our top ten for the Spill Crew coming up, but I've said it thirty times on the site already. I'm gonna say it again. Midnight in Paris is my favorite movie this year. Uh, it's just it, it's out on Blu-ray, so you can see it for yourself now. It, it's one of the best films Woody Allen has ever done, and a guy period for a guy who's done over forty movies in his lifetime, uh, several of which have have won quite a few of which have won Academy Awards. That's really <laughs> saying something. And and for me, somebody who does not like Woody Allen movies or Woody Allen at all, this was such a surprise to me how much the film resonated with me and how much I absolutely loved it. I thought it was one of those movies that has a ton of heart and has a great concept, but not a concept that's overly weighty. Like yeah. the whole movie's very breezy and it just, I, I, I loved it. I love the cinematography. I love that. Well, basically I guess, I guess we should explain the fucking story here. Uh, it's just basically about a screenwriter who is in Paris with his fiance, whose fiance is a, Super type A nut job, uh, mm-hmm. obsessed with appearances. Yes, obs- but it's Rachel McAdams, and she has the most perfect ass in the world. So I will, she yeah, the most yeah. perfect. That's what I meant many by type things. A personality. <laughs> many uh, things. Yes, and basically, he is trying to use. He he's falling in love with Paris. Uh, as a writer, he wants to branch out and not just write studio bullshit anymore. He wants to write a novel, and he finds that Paris is inspiring him so much, and he's such a fan of uh of the classic artists that used to gather in Paris in the 20s. He goes for a walk, and at around midnight, he gets picked up by this car and and taken to a bar where all of these people are alive and having a party, and he has no idea why he's there. Yeah. And it's it's pretty spectacular where it goes from there. And, and for a guy who's like, he's like, his whole, like, 
he's got this fantasy about what Paris was. Yeah. You know, very nostalgic. Yeah. Very nostalgic about it. Very living in the past about it as an mm-hmm. artist himself. is like, man, I wish I could have been there in that time. And so the idea of this guy who gets to, I mean, be right in the middle of this, like hanging out with Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald and yeah. Josephine Baker and Gertrude Stein and Picasso and Salvador Dali is like, it's weird. Even if you as a viewer don't particularly care about any of those people or even know that much, Owen Wilson and Woody Allen's script by Rote transfers that excitement to you and that understanding of how amazing this would be. When you see how excited he gets, you you get excited too. You're like, whoa, wow, this is great. And they're talking about the nature of art, just like, you know, mm-hmm. like what the experiences of being a creator through a lot of it. Uh, and ultimately what it's talking about is living in the now. I mean, that's mm-hmm. the point of this whole thing. The gr- kind of the grass is always greener, just except be happy with where you are kind of stuff. But it's so incredibly clever. It's funny that some people called this one of the the like l- less like message heavy of Alan's films. And I totally disagree. I thought it perfectly meshes his message, which is a not a very well explored one in yeah. film uh, with the comedy. And is, I, I think far more optimistic and upbeat than a lot of his comedy. Yeah. Cause I mean, he, I mean the character goes through some stuff, but never to that point. Cause there is a thing with comedies, especially any kind even not that this is necessarily a romantic comedy, but it's romanticized. There are all these things that happen typically in these type of comedies that are so obnoxious because you know they wouldn't happen exactly that way, but they happen. I, I'm not going to go into them, but suffice to say that they don't happen in this movie. And they start to go toward them, and they're like, you know what? No, we're gonna go. We're gonna go our own way. And it's so refreshing. I, I love that about it. And it's it's more upbeat than I think a lot of Woody Allen's comedy. I got so much out of it of a lot of just the straight portrayals of these characters. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, well, for one thing, Marion Cotillard, who I believe her character Adriana was fictional that she was, in, it, uh, but I'm yeah. not entirely sure. I don't. I, I and this is maybe my ignorance, but I don't remember her being historically part of the same group but she's like you know a young ingenue who is coming <laughs> into the scene and is dated is dating picasso at the time ends up dating uh hemingway but but owen wilson has its own crisis like oh i'm so hot for this girl we've got so much in common mm-hmm. and yet i'm engaged back in the future to rachel mcadam <laughs> to a back to the so oh back my to the God. future you need to find a way to man with two brains this thing and make them into <laughs> one body or something um i think it looks good uh, but you got these great <laughs> performance adrian brody as salvador dolly is hysterical he's quite funny but the 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 standout is Corey stoll's ernest hemingway thank you who is so brilliant i mean you just look do yourself a favor before you see this film if you've never read a hemingway just read his wikipedia page right <laughs> just about his philosophies and the type of stuff he wrote about yeah just you can... have a general idea of who the man was exactly and then watch this and you'll see why this is so goddamn fun and what's great is when you know as a kid my dad was such a huge hemingway nut and you know, told me all these things about it. I read Hemingway, and uh, I was excited to watch this movie with my dad, and, like, how spot-on Corey Stoll's portrayal of Ernest Hemingway is is just phenomenal. And my dad, who is, who is basically an expert on Hemingway, just sat there loving every second of it, and it was I, so I can, rewarding. I'm going to see my parents in, in a week, and I can hardly wait to show them this movie. This is a great movie to watch with your parents. Absolutely. Like, just in general. All I'm right. sorry, this movie made $143 fucking million. Dollars. And it's a Woody Allen Dear film. God. Yeah. Those are huge fucking numbers it for is, this type in the of first, film. In yeah. the first week, it was the most successful Woody Allen film of all time. In the first week. Yeah. What does that just, tell you? Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is that it's a good movie to take your parents to see yeah, opening huge, weekend. Huge fuck off numbers or, for this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Huge fuck off numbers. Huge just, fuck off numbers. 143 million is fucking insane. It is insane. That's the, And I can't say enough good things about it. It's one of those movies that... Every time I see it, I like it more, and I will go back and watch it again and again and again. Absolutely. Uh, But that ends it for this section, because we've talked about all the new releases that aren't what we're talking about in our next section, which is (laughs) horror, because we're, it's, it's, come on, it's, it's me, Brian, and Luke, we gotta talk about horror. And there's a bunch- We'd be crazy not to. There's a bunch of new horror releases, including some stuff that came out this year, uh, so before we do that, though, it's time for another giveaway. Giveaway! So now I gotta look through the list. And you know what? We were talking about 3D earlier, so why not this? Here's I got four of the people who you know you're out there who've actually got those 3D sets. I got four of the Blu-ray HD 3D sets here from <laughs> Disney. I've got Bolt, Meet the Robinsons, 
Nomeo and Juliet, and G-Force. Oh, boy, G-Force. Okay. And yes, but thank you to Disney for providing those. Well, plus them. the other ones are pretty damn good. Yeah. It's Bolton and Meet the Robinsons, at least. You know what? I, I Actually, I love Nomeo and Juliet. I, I haven't hu- seen it. Huge fan of that movie. It sounds retarded, and then we all walked out. It was another surprise film. We walked out going, uh, wow, did anybody else like that as much as I did? Yeah. yeah and we all really, really liked it. See, there you go. Uh, maybe not G-Force 3D so much, but maybe... But, but Bolt is absolutely outstanding. Bolt is absolutely wonderful. Actually, Meet the Robinsons is fun it maybe goes on a little bit too long but all of these are great films especially if you have kids around heck yeah uh because they will just they're all so super colorful and like i said they're in fucking three days yeah these are really really nice like Uh, four disc sets now i don't know how you want to do the uh the the thing for this one because i got four totally different films here so what do do you want to do oh as far as coming up with one keyword yeah what do you mean the keyword and how we're going to decide who gets what Oh, goodness. We're going to work this out on mic. That's wow. Right. Yeah, I, I say that uh, that we go like in order. The first four, and then the first guy gets to pick. There you go. Oh, that's you know? interesting. Yeah, yeah. As each person So goes, you, you know if you're number four, you're getting stuck with fucking G-Force. And we're but sorry G-Force about in that. 3D. But it is G-Force in 3D. Uh, so what's the code word, though? Oh, okay. So it needs to be something related to 3D, but not as easy as just 3D. Uh, so... Sticky fingers. Sticky fingers. I was just thinking because of kids, but oh, three go go oh. with something three D related. <laughs> uh, how about yeah, red versus with... blue? Red versus blue. There right? you go. That's good. And those guys at Rooster Teeth will be happy. There yeah, you go. Absolutely. <laughs> See what I did there? Yeah. If you guys aren't familiar with the Red versus Blue uh, series, please hop on over to roosterteeth.com. Check out the good work that they do. Oh, very very funny. In fact, our friend from Master Pancake, uh, John Erler, has been appearing in a lot of their live action shorts. They've been doing. Like, yeah, they're really starting to branch out a lot. I know uh, Bernie Burns over there is. Uh, is really trying to do uh, a lot of different stuff. So. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy the direction those guys are heading. They're going all over the all over the place, trying different things. They're and, blowing and up, yo! Pretty consistently funny, and they're from Absolutely. fucking Austin, yeah, yo! Yeah, they are. Austin. Yeah. yeah, maybe we can talk them into coming back to Spill.com again like they did two years ago. Whoop. So, uh, Anyway, we're going to take a break, and we will be back with horror. And like I said, don't forget, if you want those 3D things, the code is red versus blue.